This week on the GCN Racing News Show, more racing than you can shake a stick at. Voss is still boss, Cav is back, Van Aert's lucky number 13, Gruparma FTG's Spanish spree, a win for Winder, controversial cameras, a relaxation of the bottle rule and a massive contract extension for Remco Evenepoel. We'd better get started. <laughs> And we are going to start with the men's Amstel Gold. Shorter than normal at 216 kilometers this year on a circuit instead of its usual route and with less climbing than we'd normally expect. But it's the riders that make the race and it was some race they made. The attacking started in earnest with well over 50 kilometers remaining and really didn't stop until they crossed the finish line. The main attack of the day though came on the Kalberg with a little over one lap remaining. Wout van Aert, who had the full team at his disposal, including Primoz Roglic, attacked and drew a group clear that also included Pidcock, Alaphilippe, Matthews and Carapaz. And it wasn't long, in fact, before Ineos Grenadiers had a third rider involved with former winner Michal Kwiatkowski. And even that was not the end of the attacking. Kwiatkowski ended up going off the front and once caught, Pidcock countered, taking Van Aert and Max Schachmann with him. And that ultimately was the group that would decide the podium positions between them. Van Aert led out with 200 metres remaining, Pidcock managed to draw alongside him and just pip him on the line. At least that's what this shot from the finish line suggested. However, after UCI Commissaires examined the actual photo finish, which is from a different camera and apparently a slightly different line, it was Van Aert who was given the win. Now, I don't think I've ever looked into the ins and outs of finish line photos before, but what with that finish and the equally close call of the women's Brabant's appeal on Wednesday, I've started to understand a little bit more about how they work or not, as the case may be. Uh, Velo News actually reposted an article yesterday in which Leonard Zinn explained exactly how photo finishes work, and we're going to post a link to that in the description just below this video. This is the image that was used by the UCI to separate Van Aert from Pidcock. It's still not clear, far from it in fact, but I guess we have to assume that there was at least one pixel between Van Aert's tyre and Pidcock's as it crossed the line. Now the thin red line is not the same as the black line that we see on the road marking at the finish, but rather a computer generated line. And the image of the riders is of each of them as they cross that line, rather than, as it can appear, one single photo being taken of the winner crossing the line and then the other riders a few meters further back. Now that same line, if you know the exact shutter speed of the camera, which is apparently three and a half thousand frames per second, can also be used to calculate the time difference between two riders, which was four thousandths of a second between Van Aert and Pidcock. As I said, there is more detail in that Velo News article, which will give you a much clearer explanation than I'm currently giving. But my concern is if the finish line on the road is not quite the same as the artificial line that is drawn across the photo finish. In fact, Zinn claims that the finish line camera is always placed on the white line just before what most of us would expect to be the actual finish line. The reason for that is because if it was placed on that black finishing line, the camera wouldn't be able to distinguish between two black tyres going over a black line. This photo from Dan Van Raith on Twitter shows what a finish line setup looks like with the camera position just before the line we all look at. Uh, the UCI has a document on this subject too called the Timekeeping Guide and here on page 12 you can see where the camera should be aligned. Again, it's just before the black line, although apparently it's supposed to be by just two pixels. However, Given the colour of the background on the official photo finish at Amstel Gold when compared to the sponsor boards on the barriers behind, some people, like Tom Lynch, have speculated that the camera was positioned significantly before that line. And that might explain why this picture appears to show Pidcock's wheel slightly in front of Van Aert's as they crossed the black line, whilst it was behind it a couple of centimetres before. However, to then add more confusion to this matter, you'd imagine that the contrary would be true last Wednesday at Brabant's Appeal. There, it was the American champion Ruth Winder who was coming from behind with speed, closing in on Demi Vollering. The side-on shots of the riders crossing the line showed fairly clearly that Vollering's wheel crossed it first, but then this official photo finish, shown later, showed it was in fact the American champion Ruth Winder who had won her first victory since last year's Tour Down Under. Now my theory on this is that in this instance, the photo finish camera might have been placed on the white line after the black finishing line, by which point Winder had got her wheel in front. However, as ever, I may well be wrong. In fact, that's quite likely. So if you've got any extra insight on this or even your own theory on it, I'd love to hear from you. 
Let me know by taking our poll and commenting beneath it over on the GCN app. Again, we'll put a link to that in the description below. Uh, this though is still one of the things I absolutely love about cycling. Even after decades watching the sport, you still learn something new almost every day and there are constant talking points. Either way, it was Van Aert who was deemed the winner and he will now enjoy a well-earned break before building up towards the Tour de France this summer. And you could say that the first part of his season wasn't too shabby. 13 days of racing in total, four big wins, and never outside the top 13. And in Amstel yesterday, his race number was 13. Lucky for some, perhaps. Uh, enjoy your rest, Wout, and thanks for the entertainment so far this year. Uh, here's what he had to say, though, after being told he'd lost the podium Amstel beer drinking competition to Max Shackman. Now, Max Shackman said he won the beer drinking competition on the podium. <laughs> The race, so I guess you have that race. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I'm happy for him that he won this competition, but uh, apparently he didn't know it was uh, 0.0, so uh, it, was, it was not a real contest, it was just a uh, lemonade. Have you seen the photo finish? No. You can't really tell. <laughs> no. You can't really tell from that photo. Uh, one thing is for sure though, we have not seen the last of Tom Pidcock. A man of the match though, for most of us I'd imagine, was the young Belgian Mary van Sevenet of De Koenig Quickstep. He had a mechanical, got back on, crashed, chased back on a second time, and then was still riding on the front of the chasing group until about 10 kilometers to go. Chapeau, that was some ride. For Jumbo Visma though, it was a rather successful Sunday in the Netherlands. It had been 20 years since they last won their home race with Eric Decker back when it was Rabobank in 2001. But yesterday, they won it twice in one day. Mariana Vos rode with all of the composure and tactical nous that we've come to expect from her to take the win in one of the few races that had eluded her up to that point. Uh, she wasn't the strongest on the day and was actually dropped on the final ascent of the Calbo by Cassia Nubidoma and Aliso Longo Borghini, who'd gone clear of everyone else. And it was a really intriguing final, with Longo Borghini sitting on for the final part of the race, presumably citing her relatively weak sprint as a reason not to work. Uh, Nubidoma, though, wasn't having any of it and wasn't going to tow her to the line, and so they slowed and slowed and slowed and were ultimately caught by the chasing group. Voss didn't need a second invitation, and despite sitting up in celebrations rather uncomfortably early, she did indeed win ahead of Demi Vollering and Annemiek van Vleuten, which made it an all-Dutch podium for the first time since the very first edition of that race back in 2001. She's just incredible, Voss, isn't she? It's 16 years since she first won the Elite Women's World Championship title. That was in Salzburg, and I understand she's got absolutely no intention of retiring anytime soon. Still, she hasn't managed to finish six Amstel golds in one day, like me, according to our caption designer yesterday. Thanks for that, I think. Meanwhile, over at the Tour of Turkey, the big news was the return of Fabio Jakobsen to competition and the return of Mark Cavendish to his winning ways. Uh, in the end, the Manxman won four of the eight stages. The third of those gave his team De Koenig Quickstep their 800th victory, and his fourth brought his own career tally up to a whopping 150 pro wins. I don't mind admitting that I didn't think I'd see him win another bike race, and I think I might well have said that on the record too. I thought he was done, and although this is just a tour of Turkey, I am very pleased to see him back to his winning ways and not whimpering into retirement as it looked like he might late last year. For those of you who didn't see it, I actually did a touchscreen analysis of his first three wins. Uh, you can find that right here on GCN Racing. Thanks for all your positive feedback, incidentally, on that one. We will try and do some more of them when our rights allow us to. Now, the other two sprint finishes since last week's racing news show both went to Jasper Philipson of Alpes in Phoenix, uh, but the general classification was effectively decided on the mountaintop finish of stage five. There, Jose Manuel Diaz of Delco took the stage and with it the bonus seconds and the lead of the race, which he kept through to the finish yesterday. But only just. Jay Vine of Alpes in Phoenix took three bonus seconds on stage seven, taking him to just one second from the lead, but that was as close as it got. A very promising performance though from Vine in what was his first ever race as a pro rider. Uh, so the 25 year old Australian is a former mountain biker and he won the men's Zwift Academy last winter, which gave him his spot on Alpes in Phoenix. Uh, he moved to Girona just one month ago and apparently the day after he arrived, he rode the most famous climb in that region, the Rocca Corba, twice. 
The first time was presumably a warm-up because the second time he took the KOM, somewhere ahead of James Knox, Simon Yates and a host of other hitters. Australia's got talent and so does Vine and it's going to be very interesting to see how his career progresses this year and beyond. Uh, third place overall went to the Argentinian Eduardo Sepulveda, whilst Philipson took home the green points jersey. Next up, what's coming up on GCN Plus? A lot, as ever, is the answer. So the Tour of the Alps starts today, and in fact, many of you will have watched the first stage by the time this video comes out. Vlasov, Sivakov, Froome, McNulty, Pino, Simon Yates, Carthy, Martin, Martinez, Quintana, Bardet, and Sosa are amongst the many stars on the start line there, many of whom will be using this as their final preparation for the Giro d'Italia, which almost unbelievably starts less than three weeks from now. On Wednesday, we have both the men's and the women's flesh full on, and on Sunday, it's the final spring classic of the year, the men's and women's Liège Baston Liège. Now, there are more territory restrictions that apply to those ones, so please check if it's available where you are. Uh, incidentally though, we will have pre and post race shows on GCN Plus, and we'll have a preview coming out for Liège Baston Liège right here on GCN Racing this coming Thursday. Beyond the racing, we have got two more documentaries coming out this week as well, one of which is all about ketones. That is a legal substance used regularly in some teams, whilst completely banned for all riders in other teams. Either way, not many people like to talk about them, which is why we wanted to delve a little deeper into what they are exactly and what the benefits may offer. Uh, here's a sneak peek of what you'll be able to watch later on this week, Friday, in fact. Athletes never produce ketones. You might be able to use them to provide extra energy. I've enlisted the help of an ex-professional to try and put ketones to the test. Three, two, one. I have no doubt that ketones can improve performance. Wow, what a difference. What's a little more controversial is whether that's actually performance enhancing. There are a lot of side effects. Nausea, vomiting. Oh. Ketones will suppress your appetite. I certainly don't feel like eating the cheese sandwich that Connor does right now. Don't forget that all of our films and documentaries are available in all GCN Plus territories. So whilst I know there are some frustrations when it comes to live racing, that shouldn't be the case with the films. Anyway, we're going to go back to racing now, and a midweek race, in fact, of Brabant's Appeal, which gives us a perfect transition from cobbles to climbs because it includes both. Uh, I've already mentioned the women's race, but in the men's, last year's winner, Julian Alaphilippe, was absent, but we still had a cracking race nonetheless. Tom Pidcock accelerating on one of the many climbs that littered the route, taking Wout van Aert and Matteo Trentin with him, bridging to the early break, attacking again with van Aert a little later, and bridging to Trentin, who'd gone solo. And then he showed them both how it's done in the sprint to the line. We really are blessed with the young talent we've got in bike racing at the moment. That was just the 11th day of racing for Tom Pidcock as a pro rider, and he's still only 21 years of age. Next up, the Vuelta a la Comunidad Valenciana, which turned out to be a rather successful race for French squad Groupama FDG. Miles Scottson managed to win solo on day one, despite this crash on the run into the finish line. Uh, that was his second pro win and his first since the Australian National Championships in 2017. It was the first of two consecutive stages held under far from ideal conditions, and the second of those was so cold and wet that in the sprint to the line, most riders still had their rain jackets on, which is a very rare sight indeed. The rain in Spain falls mainly in April, it seems. A triumph thing on that particular day was French champion Arnaud Demar, his 77th career victory, but amazingly, his first in Spain. Uh, Timothy Dupont and Caleb Ewan finished second and third on that stage, respectively. The following day, though, was the Queen stage of the race, and it saw Enric Mas of Mobistar taking his first win for 18 months. Uh, he was part of a small group which came to the line, and he managed to comfortably get the better of them before that line, taking the overall race lead in the process. And so, it all hinged on stage four, a 14 kilometer individual time trial. Uh, Mass went into it with an eight second advantage over Victor Lafay of Cofidis, but his main worry, despite the 51 seconds that separated them, was the Swiss time trial champion, Stefan Kuhn. Uh, he blitzed around the course at an average speed of just shy of 53 kilometers per hour to take the stage win, but was it enough for the GC? Well, it was close, very close, until Mass got a front wheel puncture. He'd end up conceding one minute and 27 seconds and slipped from first to third on the general classification. This was his reaction. He's angry. He is really, really, really angry. Understandable, I'd say. That is an incredibly frustrating way to lose a race. 
Kung, though, uh, had taken the race lead, and not only did he defend that lead on the final day, he rode on the front in the yellow jersey, leading out his teammate Demar to his second victory of the race. So a pretty good haul for Groupama FDG, that. Five stages in total, they took four of them and the GC, and first and second in the points classification. Right, we'll finish with a couple of other bits of news. Uh, so there were two riders DQ'd last week for adopting an illegal position in races. Gert Leemhazer of Jumbo Visma in Brabant's Appeal and then Alex Richardson of Alpes in Fenix in the Tour of Turkey, who was riding on the front of the bunch like this. A position I think Chris Froome christened a pinky grab, but which clearly contravenes the new UCI rules. In fact, Thomas de Gint posted a photo of the UCI do's and don'ts when it comes to rider positions, in which Matt Stevens is used as an example to pro riders of the sort of position they should adopt. Not something they, I, or probably even Matt thought would ever be a thing. Next thing, they'll be using him as an example for pro cyclocross riders on how to clip in quickly. Whatever next. Sticking with UCI rules, they made a tweak to the bottle littering rule last week. Hooray! But unfortunately, that does not mean that pros can now go back to throwing them gently to fans. Boo. Uh, the adaptation simply means that a rider caught throwing a bottle outside of the designated zones will be given a fine and a UCI points deduction for a first offence in a one-day race, rather than being disqualified like Michael Shah and Letizia Borghese at the recent Tours of Flanders. Meanwhile, Vincenzo Nibali's Giro d'Italia ambitions took a large setback last week when the Italian crashed in training, breaking his wrist. Now, he's already undergone surgery and will apparently be able to resume training three days after that operation, which is basically now. Uh, he's hoping he'll make a quick recovery and be on the start line in Italy. In slightly better news, there have been some contract extensions at De Koenig Quickstep. Julien Alaphilippe, who's taken over 30 wins with that squad, will remain there until at least the end of 2024, whilst Remco Evenepoel, who is yet to return to competition after that crash at last year's Il Lombardia, has extended for a further five years, the longest contract any rider has ever had on that particular team. Which hopefully means good news for the team itself, which from what we last heard, didn't have a guaranteed sponsorship beyond this year. Maybe they've secured long-term sponsorship, or maybe this is a chicken and egg situation, whereby those contract extensions will perhaps help team manager Patrick Lefebvre secure funding for the future. Here's hoping, because it's very hard to imagine cycling without them. Right, thank you once again for watching. Don't forget to keep your eyes peeled for our Liège Baston Liège preview on Thursday. And if you haven't already watched it, could I finish please by recommending this video by Connor Dunn on daring to dream to become a professional cyclist. It's a brilliant watch, so I'd encourage you to click on it now. See you soon. Bye for now.